Welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shell, and I'm joined by Yed Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Good evening. Hi. So today we are reviewing the second book in our series, Apocalypse Soon, a series all about climate and environmental fiction. The book we are talking about is The Man with the Compound Eyes by Wu Ming Yi. If this is your first time joining us, we are also a literary book club on Reddit. You can find our discussions on Reddit by clicking on the link in the episode description. If you'd like to support us in your local bookstore, you can go to the bookshop.org link. That's also in the episode description. We are also on social media at Canonical Pod. Next week, we'll have a discussion of The Man with the Compound Eyes. We hope you'll join us for that episode as well. So this book was my pick for our series. The Man with the Compound Eyes is a 2011 novel by Taiwanese writer Wu Mingyi. Wu is a writer, an artist, professor, an environmental activist, and I believe um, a butterfly collector. He's really into butterflies as well. Yes, yes. A lepidopterist. Yes, that word exactly. Yeah, say it again, Sam. <laughs> a lepidopterist. Exactly. Yeah, like Nabokov. Yeah. He also wrote a short story about butterflies, which is kind of on the same themes as this novel. Wu has been described as an influential young writer in Taiwan. I think he's in his 30s, I want to say. Possibly he just turned 40 or early 40s. No, he's 50. Holy shit, really? Wow. Young is a different thing in Taiwan. Well, I was going to say young is a different thing for writers. Um, he also does not look 50. If you look at pictures no. of him, he looks very young. It's all that rock climbing I assume he does. Yeah. Yeah, he does not look 50 at all. Yeah, or it could be the butterfly collecting that keeps him young. <laughs> so, a not-so-young writer in Taiwan, the man with the compound eyes, is probably his most well-known work because it was the first to be translated into English. But I'd say that his later work, The Stolen Bicycle, is probably a stronger work. I read probably about 25 pages of it, and it's pretty good, actually, better than this book. And that book is more critically acclaimed. I think it was a finalist for the Man Booker International Prize. And from what I've read of that book, I think it's probably deserving of that recognition. This book has been described as an ecological parable. I thought that was kind of interesting, but after having read the book, I started to think it's probably more of a marketing ploy. Because is it actually a parable, do you think? I mean, if you call it a parable, doesn't that mean that it's a story that's meant to teach you something? Yes. I think that's the requisite definition. Like, that's what a story has to do if it's a parable. Yeah. I think you can learn from this novel, and I think it may intend to teach you something, but it's a really tough course. It's like <laughs> much harder than it should be. If his point was to teach you, he's doing it way wrong. Yeah. Right. The, that This is one of those classrooms where the discussion is going way over your head, and when you take the test, it's not the test you thought it was going to be. I mean, a parable, I think the connotation is it's, it's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be accessible. Like the point of it is to teach. Right. Uh, I definitely don't think it's a parable for that reason. I, I agree. It It is not a simple lesson that he's trying to get across. I mean, if you think about Parable of the Sower, right, in the name, uh, that we read some series ago, that I think is you know much more of a parable because Butler is trying to teach you something. Like, you leave the book thinking, okay, this is what Butler wants me to believe. Yes. I would say that this is different from that because everything that Wu might want to teach you about is in this novel. There is no kind of metaphoric or figurative connection. What he wants us to think about is what's in the book. Well, can you explain how that's different, yet from parable of the sower or other like more conventional widely known parables like biblical parables well i think the biblical parable you know it takes a simple story told in kind of commonplace terms but it's clearly connected to a much larger idea something more abstract but i think with this novel it starts already with this kind of 
I don't want to get too negative from the beginning, but it's really unfocused. And it starts kind of in the abstract. We don't know where to look. And what it wants you to focus on is also something kind of abstract and difficult to look at. If it were looking at something simpler and more tangible, then I could say it was more of a parable. Right, because in Parable of the Sower, Butler is obviously intending to write about empathy, right? Like, that's what she right. wants you to take away from it. It's something that you can grapple with in the book. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I think that this novel, it starts complicated and the meaning is complicated. It needs to start simple and move towards a complicated meaning. So in this book, there are two main storylines, but it is complicated. There are actually many storylines, but there are two main storylines. The first follows Atalei, a Pacific Islander from the fictional island of Wayo Wayo, um, which is how I'm pronouncing it. You might call it Wayo Wayo. And he needs to leave the home island, his home island, because the island has a belief that uh, second sons need to leave the island to curb overpopulation. So he ends up um, leaving the island and he is marooned on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I think there's another name for it. Some people call it what the Garbage Vortex, which maybe is yeah. a better name for it. The Trash Vortex. Yeah. I've seen it as um, the Garbage Patch, which makes it sound more of like a, like a fun place you go to, you know, like a Cabbage Patch. The Trash Vortex is uh, maybe more apt in terms of tone. So that's where he ends up. And this trash vortex slash garbage patch is uh, slowly making its way to Taiwan. The second storyline is about Alice. She's a literature professor who lives in Taiwan. She recently lost her husband, Tom, and her boy, Toto, in a mountain climbing accident. She plans to commit suicide, but before she's able to, the trash vortex or at least a part of the trash vortex, smashes into Taiwan. So those are the two main storylines. There are other minor plot points. Um, one involves, I'm going to say, Rasula. It's Atalei's lady love. There are other plot points involving Aboriginal Taiwanese, non-Taiwanese who visit the island. And I think it's worthwhile to note that it sounds like this is a very simple plot structure in that you have two main storylines and they literally smash into each other as a result of an ecological disaster. But actually, the book resists this kind of easy coherence. The book presents, by way of its many characters, various relationships between man and nature. Just to go through some of them, Tom, Alice's husband, he is a mountain climber, but he's also just someone who generally wants to experience nature or challenge himself. An all-around adventurer. Yeah, he's an adventurer. Like, he wants to explore the world. So his engagement with nature is one of, I don't know how if you would describe it as like a voyeuristic relationship, but he's someone who wants to kind of overcome nature. He wants to challenge himself by climbing mountains, by exploring different unknown areas, right? And then you have Toto, her son. He wants to collect and categorize insects. So it's another way of interacting with nature. An essay that you referenced, Yed, described him as autistic. I don't remember. Was that explicitly stated in the book? No, I don't think so. But his kind of intensity when it comes to categorizing things seems very focused. You know, he's not the normal kid. Right. And there was there was early on um, talk about his development, that he was underdeveloped in a certain way. But I don't remember how specific it got with that. Oh, right. He didn't speak until he was like three years old. Yeah. 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 So there are hints, but... I, I don't think it's explicitly stated that he's autistic. At least I don't remember it being explicitly stated. There is a whaler who is the father of... This is one of those minor characters. I don't even remember who he's the father of. Um, is she a scientist? She's a marine biologist, I think. Okay. Her father is a whaler, and he is uh, someone who sees hunting, whaling, as a sport. But it's only interesting to him because there's a possibility that he could die. 
Like for him, that's the fairness of hunting. Um, there are also seal hunters who don't have that point of view at all. They just view it as a way of profiting off of nature by killing seals and cutting off their dicks. <laughs> and then there's more. Uh, there's the guy who um, helps create a tunnel through a big mountain. Right. Mm -hmm. There's definitely more. Somebody might say there's too much. <laughs> some might. But I think what's interesting is that every character does have some kind of relationship to nature, and it's typically different from another character's relationship to nature. So one of the reasons why I picked this book is a reviewer, and I think it was more than one reviewer, compared this book to Murakami's work. And, uh, okay, I, I kind of see the resemblance. I, I know what they mean in that this book attempts to be weird in certain ways that Murakami's work is weird. However, this book, I think, just falls far short of that comparison. And there's two main reasons. One, Murakami, he is meditative, and his plots, his storylines do kind of bend and wend here or there, but they do move forward. I think this book really struggles with moving forward. The storylines here kind of just lack any kind of propulsion. So that's one problem. It's just the plot has a lot of underdeveloped strands. Uh, the second problem is I think the prose is just bad. I place the blame at the foot of the translator. I think the prose is functional. It reads like someone who's used to translating a textbook, but I don't think there's much in the way of uh, beauty of language. I think there's just a lack of um, a year, like an artistic ear for language, and some really terrible word choices in the book. In fact, I thought when I was reading the book that this was translated by a non-native English writer. I actually saw something that the translator wrote, and he talked about some of his choices. Oh, you know how I love those. Okay. Lay it on me. He he doesn't seem to be a very careful translator. Like there is a, an area in the novel that they call Haven, and that word has a lot of connotations, right? But in the original Chinese, Wu just calls it H County, which is more like stripping away connotations. It's like those old Russian novels where people are just called K or D. It's removing specificity. And then the translator is just adding tons of ideas by calling this area Haven. Like, he just does not seem to be a very good translator. What? Oh, that's... Ugh. Yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. Because he's trying to layer meaning that doesn't actually add anything to the novel. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, that is one of the problems of this book, is that... The way the book is written, it actually prevents meaning from coming through. Like, on yes. on all levels. Um, on the plot level, even with characterization, though characterization, I guess, is okay. It's just kind of clumsy. But definitely on the idea level. Yeah. I mean, characterization is okay because you meet Alice and she wants to kill herself and you don't like her and you end up feeling like, yeah, you probably should kill yourself. <laughs> like, none of these people are likable or interesting. It's like, I don't have any strong positive or negative feelings about any of them. Well, a lot of the way we are given information, whether it's about people or about history or anything, is, as you put it, like a textbook. So much of it is exposition and not meaningful exposition. It's just data dump. You know, you're you're given a whole history where maybe just a couple paragraphs would do. It doesn't really give you that much about a person's like internal ruminations or anything like that. It it just gives you this rundown of a historical figure who is not actually a historical figure. I agree with you, but you know how I love Colson Whitehead and remember how he wrote at length about the different kinds of elevators and such. And I could sure. read pages and pages of Colson Whitehead just giving me minutia. 
about something. Uh, yeah, for but there's me, a difference. Right. That's the difference. I attribute it to prose. I think the prose is just bad. Like, the language does not captivate the reader. I don't think it's the prose. I don't think the ideas are there. Like, I think he doesn't know where the emotional impact or the intellectual impact is. He just spreads all of his exposition everywhere, and he hopes that some of it will stick. I don't think either of you are wrong. I think I think it can be both things. <laughs> there are good images. Yes. But they are very sporadic, I would say. There are also very bad images. Tom's penis, I think, is compared to a miner going into a cave at some point. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's great. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you think about your penis, but that was really uncomfortable. Yeah, there, there's a number of uh, times when he brings up penises uh, and feet, feet too, that are very weird. So there, there's a whole lot of different issues. There's poor and confusing grammar. There's unnecessary quotation marks. Yeah, there's yeah that's just bad. Rhetorical questions that can work with the right writer, but you have to really like the voice in order for that to work. And usually it was not good here. There are facts that don't really make sense, like books somehow surviving floating on open oceans. Overuse of adverbs, especially things like actually and apparently. For example, someone is being described and he says, apparently he was of medium build, which makes it sound like that that fact is being related by a third party or something, when that's not actually true. It's someone telling you how this other person was built. One person is giving a prayer, and it is translated as... Some, something akin to the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. While I understood the meaning of that and that it's supposed to be in this old language, what you have to remember is that the person giving this prayer is giving it in Mandarin, which is not his native language. His native language is uh, this Yoan language. So somehow he knows enough to use this archaic form in mandarin but the archaic form we're given is in english it's it doesn't make any sense at all i i want to say here though as somebody who has been learning mandarin for seven years this guy atile he is picking up mandarin way too quickly <laughs> yeah yeah but but also remember the book tells you they just kind of get it you know you just feel the language and you get it Right. Uh, clearly, they have a connection that that we don't have. Here's here's a, a full on example of strange choices of sentence construction. Later, when the Bunun people hunted or worked on the land, they would sometimes, often, or always listen to the sound of the stream for a long time. <laughs> Why not just say often? It doesn't matter if it's correct. <laughs> You have to you cover have... your bases here. Like, what if another translator was like, hold on, I read the original text, and that's not what the writer says. So the translator had to cover his bases. Right. Oh. It's just bad writing. I mean, it's it reminded me of translation students I taught who are undergrads or graduate students in a Chinese university, how they would just translate words word by word and put them together. And the grammar would be right, but it just had no artistic value. And there are, like, other issues. Um, there was a point of view shift. I didn't really like it. Um, it shifted to first person. I thought that was strange. I struggled with how the writer uses the Pacific Islander Wayo Wayo, Wayo Wayo tribe. It's kind of bad taste to use primitive society to symbolize untainted nature because it's cliched. I don't think that's exactly how the Weo Weo tribe is being used here. But it's just, as as a reader of this in English, it's just clumsy and it it's kind of lacks nuance. It feels just cliched. I don't know if you guys felt the same way or not. 
I mean, as soon as we saw Alice and then we saw Atile and we went to Wyo Wyo, we knew it was coming, right? Like, obviously, these two are going to meet. Yeah. Well, I didn't have necessarily an issue with that. It's just like, for example, uh, I'm not giving anything away here because um, this is fairly early on in the book, but when Atile leaves the island, there's this ritual where he has sex with ladies. It's something that someone from civilization would write when they're trying to describe what they think a primitive society is like, right? It's just, it's just a little bit too, I'd say cliched. It doesn't make any sense for me, really. Someone who's like, oh, what are Aboriginal people like? Well, they have a lot of sex. I mean, he's definitely like, a lepidopterist and not an anthropologist, so... He's showing his lack of knowledge of what primitive people might really be like. I'll say that when he talks about the other Aboriginal people, it feels a lot more real yeah, than more when grounded. he talks about Wyo Wyo. Yeah. Here's a factoid. He is actually part Aboriginal himself, so that might explain some of his familiarity. Sure, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I, I think am the most given to kind of nerdy theorizing when it comes to reading among the three of us. And I think I had a lot of trouble with this book because it kind of pits my nerdy way of enjoying a book against the more aesthetic and pleasurable way of enjoying a book. Um, there is a reading that I found which is much more interesting than the novel is, which comes from the perspective of eco-criticism. And it is something we'll talk more about next week. And I like the reading. Intellectually, it's interesting. But the problem is the book is not interesting. There is no pleasure and fun and enjoyment in this novel. And the difficulty for me is that everything that makes that reading work and intellectually interesting is what makes reading this novel such a chore just from the perspective of an aesthetic experience. It's just really unpleasant. To be more specific, I think we've all kind of agreed that the problem with this novel is it has no forward momentum. And for me, I think it doesn't have the momentum because it shifts between so many different narratives and so many different characters' lives. I think what Wu was trying to do is to show something that would emerge when all of these different stories are stacked on top of each other, but they really just move in too many different directions to connect with each other. Yeah, I think this book invites or maybe even demands a second reading to fully grasp that fractured storytelling nature. But in order for that to work, the first reading has to be very successful. And I'd agree with you guys that... There's nothing about this book that made me want to revisit it and and connect all those dots in a more meaningful way the second time through. I don't think there's a guarantee that if you were to read this book a second time that you would actually leave the book with greater understanding. Right. Like some books are difficult, but you get the sense that, okay, even though it's not fun, it's difficult. And when you finish it the second time, you will understand something more. For me, I just don't get that sense. Right. You recall your, your favorite book that we've read is probably The Lime Works, right? That was a book <laughs> that I think that you probably disliked as an aesthetic object in the same way that I dislike this book. But for me, what makes that book work is that it's in your face. It's different from normal novels in a very direct way, where you know that Bernhard is doing something on purpose. When I read this novel, I just feel like Wu is not a very good writer. It seems like he's trying to do something and failing to do it, which really put me off. There are some positive parts of the book for me, but they tend to be stems of ideas in the book. For example, the Pacific Garbage Patch. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the magical elements... I thought they were okay. I don't need to have it explained to me. I'm okay with certain magical elements being unexplained. So that wasn't really an issue for me. It wasn't a problem that it wasn't coherent. For me, it's much more the plot that's the problem, not like the weird magical things that happen. The loss of a child, 
I thought that was kind of interesting, and that storyline. The problem is just that they're not all brought together, or they're not fully realized. I will say that I did have a problem with a lot of the magical elements, not because they need to be explained, they're magic. If they're magic, they don't have to be explained. But they do have to have a purpose. And I felt like most of the magical things that happen in this book are just presented to you. They're kind of dropped in your lap without any actual meaning or resonance. Early on, especially when we're dealing with Atalei on Waiowayo and on the trash island that he comes across, um, it reminded me of the life of Pi, except without the vivid imagination or the meaning behind the magical elements and without as much of a deep dive into the human condition. We do get some of those things later on and at times the imagination does come through, but on the whole, I think it is lacking. Well, for example, there are whales that have some kind of sentience and it's kind of explained why. I'm okay with that. Like, I I thought that was fine. I didn't have any issue with that. I thought it did actually add to the book, if you think about it. He's creating this kind of relationship between man and nature, right? That's why I mentioned before, like, a lot of characters have different relationships to nature. So that's an example of something where I thought, it's fine. Like, I don't need him to explain it any more than he already did. I don't need that to be more present in the book than it already is. I thought that was just fine sure there's a plot twist uh a very major one (laughs) regarding alice and tom and toto that comes at the very end of the novel and it was good it surprised me i liked it too that was a moment in the book where i literally like (laughs) like i sat up when i was reading i was like oh (laughs) okay (laughs) you have my attention now (laughs) up until then i was just like Okay, let, let's try to finish this uh, as soon as possible, because I'm done with it. Yeah. Yeah, that ending actually did get my attention. And I thought the figure, the man with the compound eyes, I thought that was okay. Like, another magical element yeah. that I was totally fine with. Yeah, but both that twist and the man with compound eyes, I was really digging deep to try and connect everything together with the conservation and environmental concerns. And I felt like I got part of the way there, but it didn't really open up until I read the article that he had mentioned. That's what really brought things together. And I I think if you have to do that much outside reading, then the book's not doing its job. See, I would push back on this a little bit in that um, while I liked the reading in the paper that the... um, the academic, I don't remember his name, that he gives, I actually think that it's fine because I don't actually need to have a unified theory. I don't think I need to leave this book thinking, okay, X equals Y, right? Like, I'm okay with things being unexplained. For me, really, it's the prose. Because for that kind of reading to work, the prose really has to do the work. I think what's missing is you don't need to have that kind of intellectual satisfaction that I think we all got from reading that essay, but there is no other satisfaction. There is no other pleasure. (laughs) So you can have one, you can have the other, you can have both, but with this book, you don't really get anything unless you're willing to go the extra mile. And it's really asking a lot from a reader. All right, then It sounds like we are ready for a break. When we come back, we will talk about if this book is worse than Vagabonds, the worst book we've read before this book.
Welcome back. So I'm sure everyone's on the edge of their seat. Vagabonds, the book we read by a Chinese writer, we deemed it the worst book that we've read so far. Is this book worse than Vagabonds? No. That book also had bad prose, but that book lacked ideas. Uh, it had some ideas. It, it had very flat ideas that didn't really go anywhere. Ed, you said no. I think I agree. I think this is a little bit better. What this book is, is a turd that an academic can polish into an essay. And Vagabonds is a turd that will remain a turd no matter how long you rub it. I think the prose here is actually worse than Vagabonds. Really? Yeah, because the prose in Vagabonds, it's kind of vapid, but it's not confusing. It's not uncertain. Like, the prose is fine in Vagabonds. The prose here, like, you cited some examples. It's just nonsensical. Yes. There are times you mentioned briefly that there's, like, random words and quotation marks. Why? Why, why would you do it? You know? Like, there's, I think, the translator used a word that is, like, colloquial 2010 young person English. And when I read it, it took me out of the book. I was just like, what is this? Does this person get this word from his daughter? Why is this in this book? What, you know, what word was that? I'm oh, I don't remember. even remember what the word is. Um, okay. It's just like, it's a word that totally did not belong at all. Whereas with Vagabonds, I thought the prose, yeah, like, it didn't serve much of a purpose, but it wasn't you know, it wasn't flawed. It was just vapid. But, however, I still think that book was worse, just because of the yeah. lack of ideas. I, even with all of the prose problems here, I think the imagery, even though it usually didn't rise above the rest of the prose, the few times it did piqued my attention enough to keep me going. And, like you said, there are ideas here, but I pretty vividly remember liking the first chapter or so of Vagabonds and being really interested and then slowly getting beaten down over the course of however many pages that was and just getting more and more disappointed as it went on. Whereas this one was frustrating, but I always felt like there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Safe to say that None of us will recommend this book to anyone. Well, here's the question, though. Why were you willing to read The Stolen Bicycle if you had such a negative reaction to this book? I think I was just really curious because that book was a finalist for The Man Booker. And even though I'm kind of a an American literature snob, I was thinking, well, I mean, you know, like that's still a prestigious prize. Are those judges just really bad? So I just decided to read a chunk of it, and it was pretty good. Legitimately a well-written literary work, to the point where I actually had to go look up if it was the same translator. I could not believe that it was the same translator, because that book, it, it also is clumsy at times. I only read, you know, like 25 pages, 30 pages, but it was also clumsy, but the language was such that the translator doesn't need to do too much work. I think the problem with this book is there are a lot of different ideas and a lot of different registers that the writer has to hit. In that book, it is very meditative. It's not very demanding the way this book is demanding of a translation. I probably will not seek out any more of his books, but I... I'm willing to be proven wrong if something comes up and we find his name in the press and he wins a Nobel Prize or something. Then, you know, I'll come back to him, but I'll wait for that to happen. All right, we'll conclude here. Thank you for listening. If you thought we were off base with this review, if you happen to like this book, well, come and tell us on Reddit. I imagine there is someone out there who likes this book. I think there has to be, yeah. Yeah, there, there's got to be. Yeah, that one academic who spent half a year writing that essay, like, he probably likes the book, right? So if you like this book, just come and let us know and explain to us why we were wrong. I don't think we're wrong. Um, I think you're wrong. 
but let us know anyway. Uh, that link to Reddit is below. We are also on social media at Canonical Pod. If you enjoyed this podcast, go ahead and give us a nice review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. That'll help us build the community. Next week, we'll be back with an in-depth discussion of this book, The Man with the Compound Eyes. We hope you'll be joining us for that one. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.